Hi, and welcome to Unix Shell Programming. My name is Ray Swartz. I'm the founder and president of Berkeley Decision Systems, a consulting firm specializing in C and Unix training. And I'll be your instructor for this video course. The goal of this course is to show you how to create your own Unix applications using a programming language available from the Unix shell. This course is designed for experienced Unix users and would not be appropriate for someone who had never used Unix before. Specifically, we're going to cover creating command files, reading command line arguments, using shell variables, shell programming commands, writing interactive shell scripts, interacting with the process environment, and creating applications with shell programming. The video training course consists of three parts. The first part is the video presentation you're currently watching. The second part is a book I wrote on this very topic called Unix Application Programming Mastering the Shell. When I refer to the text, I'll use words like book or text. Part three is the course manual. When I use words like course notes or course manual, I'll be referring to the contents of the manual. Most of the topics we're going to be covering are covered in more detail in the text than in the tape. And this is the purpose of the course manual so that you can keep track of where we are in the tape in the book. The book contains exercises, additional material, and there will be times when I'll be asking you to read chapters in the book to supplement the material we're presenting on the tape. I recommend that you keep the textbook as well as the course manual nearby while you're going through this course. This course is a continuation of the previous video course called Creating Applications with Unix Tools. In that course, we covered shell meta characters, regular expressions, Unix filters, and creating applications with pipelines. Because this tape is a continuation of Creating Applications with Unix Tools, it's important that you understand the material that was covered in that course. One way you can brush up on it is by reading through the chapters in the text on that same material. Another thing, we used an example throughout creating applications with Unix tools that we are going to continue using here. That application involved an electronic phone list. The phone list contained names and phone numbers of people that I wanted to be able to retrieve from my computer. The format of the phone list is very important, so let's take a look at that. The phone list is stored in a file called phone.list. Here you see the contents of the phone.list file that we were using in the previous tape. This file has a very specific format that makes it easier to search for the components in the file. It's always a last name, a comma, a space, the first name, a tab, and then the phone number. The phone number always is of the form a digit, dash, and then four digits. We'll be using this example during this course so that we'll have something to refer to as we create our applications. In addition to executing commands that you enter on the command line and supplying you with a rich set of meta characters to describe processes you're trying to create, the shell will also read your commands out of a file. This allows you to create your own application scripts, as they're called, 
by simply putting a set of Unix commands in a file. Instead of entering these commands one at a time, you enter the name of the file that contains these commands, and the shell will read these command lines and execute them one at a time out of the file you've identified. This makes it easier for you to run multiple commands successively, and also allows you to hide the contents of your commands behind the name of the file. Let me give you an example. Suppose you have a need to search through a file. In this case, let's assume we're using the phone list. Instead of entering the command line directly, I stored it in a file called phsmith. As you see, the file contains a grep command which will search for the word Smith at the beginning of the phone list. Basically looking for people whose last names begin with Smith. To execute this command, I simply type the name of the file that holds the command that I want to execute. The output is the same as if I'd entered the grep command that's stored in the file on the command line. This provides us a great deal of power because in addition to simply executing commands, the shell also has a programming language that will allow us to write advanced applications. I'll demonstrate some of those as we go through this course. One problem that the PH Smith file has is that it always searches for the same person's name. It'd be much more useful if I could get it to search for any pattern that I entered on the command line along with the name of the file. To do this, the shell has to be able to take arguments off the command line and hand them to the file that contains the command lines that will eventually get executed. Luckily, the shell will do this for us so that we can create scripts that will take arguments. The way the shell does this is through the use of special meta characters. After the shell scans a command line, interprets all the meta characters on the command line, and has set the command line into its final set of arguments, it stores those arguments in a way that I can reference them through commands in a script file. The shell takes the arguments on the command line and puts them in what it calls positional parameters. Positional parameters all start with a dollar and are followed by a number. Thus, the first argument on the command line is stored in dollar one. The second argument is stored in dollar two, uh, and so on. The first thing on the command line is the command you want to execute, and that's stored in a special variable, dollar zero. The shell also tells me how many arguments were on the command line in the special variable, dollar pound sign. In addition, all of the arguments on the command line are stored in a single variable, which is dollar asterisk. You'll be using these all the time, and it's good to remember what these represent. In our grep command example, caret smith would be stored in dollar one, phone dot list would be stored in dollar two, and grep would be stored in dollar zero. If inside a command file, I put dollar one, the shell will take the first argument off the command line and put it in place of where I've stored the dollar one in the file. This is how I can take arguments off the command line and insert them into my search command for the phone list. Consider this command line. Note that I've put a dollar one in place of the grep pattern. I've stored this in a file called phfind. When I run the phfind command, the argument that I put on the command line gets inserted by the shell for the dollar one 
before the command line in the file gets executed, in essence, taking the pattern I've passed to ph find and passing that pattern onto the grep command and searching the phone list for it. For example, to search for someone named Smith in the phone list, I simply enter ph find with the name Smith. What happens when you execute this command is that the shell takes the word Smith off the command line and puts it in dollar one. When it's inside the file and it sees the dollar one on the command line, it takes the word Smith and puts it there before it executes the command line. It then passes this argument to grep and grep uses it to search the phone list for a pattern Smith. One thing you need to know about shell scripts, as we call these command files, is that they have to have read and execute permissions set before somebody can use them. On ph find, as you can see, I've set read and execute permissions for everybody on the system. When you try to execute a command that does not have execute permissions, you will be told that permission has been denied. It's a mistake you make all the time. You just have to remember to change the permissions on your files before you execute them. There's one important thing to cover at the beginning of this section. There are different shells that you can use. There's the born shell, the C shell, and the corn shell. Different shells have different programming languages. Specifically, the born and corn shells use one programming set of commands, and the C shell uses a different set of programming commands. This course will cover the commands that work on the born and corn shell. The C shell can execute born shell scripts, and so everything that we're showing would work in the C shell. There's an important but subtle point that has to be made here. The shell does not interpret all meta characters at the same time. Instead, it has a very clear sequence of steps that it follows. This sequence of steps can sometimes cause problems when you're taking arguments off the command line and inserting them into your script files. The shell interprets positional parameters the dollar one, the dollar two, the dollar three. It then interprets redirection characters. It then searches for file name meta characters. Because file matching meta characters are interpreted after positional parameters are substituted on the command line, any file matching meta characters, or redirection meta characters for that matter, put into an argument will be interpreted within the script after that argument has been placed in the command line that is inside your script file. This is described in more detail and a different example is used in the textbook. And if this doesn't seem clear to you, I suggest you read that there. However, it's not important that you understand in detail how this works because there's a very simple solution. The shell will not reinterpret a substituted positional parameter if you enclose it in double quotes. You never know what a user is going to enter on the command line. As a result, you're never certain what characters are contained inside an argument when it gets substituted for a positional parameter. I always put double quotes around my positional parameters when I put them in scripts that I don't have to worry about this reinterpretation problem implemented with the shell. Let's go back to the ph find script. I've now inserted double quotes inside that script. So the current version of ph find looks like this. We've actually introduced another problem now. PH find expects the user to enter an argument on the command line. 
But as you know, users don't always do what they're expected. What happens if somebody enters ph find and does not add an argument to search for? As you can see, grep prints an error message when we enter this command. What happened was this. Because there's no command line argument for this shell to substitute for the dollar one inside ph find, grep doesn't get passed a pattern. Grep always has to be passed a pattern, and so it fails, and that's the cause of the error message. The ph find command works, but only if the user uses it properly. This is not a very effective way to write scripts that other people might use. There's a couple of problems that should be fixed with phfind. First, we saw one, which is that if the user enters no argument on the command line, phfind should do something reasonable. Either it should print out a message that tells the user how to use phfind, or maybe it should print out the entire phone list. Another problem is if the user enters too many arguments. Suppose the user wants to search for a couple of patterns in the phone list. phfind only handles the first one. It should either print a message or handle all of the patterns on the command line. The third problem that phfind might have would be if a user searches for a pattern and that pattern isn't found in the phone list at all. In this case, phfind has no output. Most users would try the command again, and possibly even a third time, before giving up in frustration. The appropriate thing to do would be to have phfind print out a message that the pattern was not found in the list. For example, I suggest that phfind work like this. If you enter a pattern that's not found in the list, it should display the pattern and the message not found in the phone list. We can solve all of these problems by using some more advanced features of the shell. It's programming constructs. Those are covered in the rest of this video course. This marks the end of this section. Please review the material and work the few exercises in the course notes. Shell contains two kinds of programming commands. One kind allows you to select which command you want to execute based on some condition. The second kind of programming construct allows you to repeatedly execute commands. We would call these loops. I'm going to start with a conditional case statement. Earlier I mentioned that the problem with phfind was that a user could enter no arguments or too many arguments and phfind wouldn't execute properly. To solve this problem, we have to have a way to execute different commands depending on how many arguments the user puts on the command line. If the user puts no arguments on the command line, we have to do one thing. If the user puts one argument on the command line, then we search for that argument in the phone list. If the user has two or more arguments on the command line, then we have to print out an error message or at least tell the user that we can only search for one pattern at a time. In programming, we call this kind of construct a conditional statement, because based upon a condition, we will execute one of several commands. One of the shell's conditional statements is called the case statement, and that's the one we're going to cover in this section. The case statement works by matching patterns between a target string that you identify 
in a series of patterns that identify the statement you wish to execute. In this example, we wish to execute different commands based on the number of arguments on the command line. Recall that the shell tells us how many arguments were on the command line in the variable dollar pound sign. I can use this as my conditional indicator to identify which command line to execute. This graphic shows a prototype of the case statement we need to use. It will also allow us to describe the syntax of the statement itself. Case statements always start with the word case. The word case is always followed by the pattern we're trying to match. In this example, we're trying to match the number of arguments on the command line, and we use dollar pound sign. That is always followed by the word in, I-N, and that's required. After the word in, you list the command lines that you wish executed based upon the condition. Note that each command line begins with a pattern. In this case, it's the number zero, the number one, or the asterisk, followed by a closing parenthesis. Those are the values we're trying to match. The matched value identifies the command line or command lines to be executed. Only one of these three lines will get executed when the script is run by the user. The one in this case that gets executed is the one that identifies the number of command line arguments passed to ph find. If there are zero, the first line gets executed. If there's only one, the second line gets executed. The star, recall, matches zero or more of any characters in the shell. That means that whatever pattern is in the case statement, the star will match it. The star, then, is the wildcard character that says, if 0 and 1 don't match the pattern, then run this command line. It's the one that's going to say, no matter how many arguments are on the command line, if there's more than one, then run this command. Because the star always matches any pattern, it should always be the last listing in a case statement. In this case, it's the last listing as well. They could have chosen to use the word end case, or end, or stop, or last line. However, the people that wrote the shell decided to use the word case spelled backwards to note the end of a case statement. That's the purpose of the word that is sometimes pronounced Ezak at the bottom of this case listing. One more thing to note about syntax. Each conditional command line terminates with a double semicolon. The main reason for this is to allow you to have several commands identified by a single option. To actually create the case statement that we want to put into phpind, we have to determine what we're going to do if there are no arguments or if there's more than one argument on the command line. If there are no arguments, I suggest that we print out a message identifying how to use phpind. I'm going to recommend that we run these two echo statements. The first one identifies how to enter the command the second line identifies what the pattern means and how it should be entered. Note the double semicolon at the end of the second echo statement, but not at the end of the first one. That's because the second echo statement is the end of this conditional section. If more than one argument has been entered, I suggest that we tell the user that too many patterns have been entered, only one is allowed with this echo statement. When all of these are assembled together, we get a case statement that looks like this. You see, 
Each command is identified by a pattern to match, and the end of each command has double semicolons for the end of that conditional section. For now, this is as far as we want to extend the ph find command, although we'll do more later. I've entered this command into a file on my system and called it phfind1. Here you see the contents of phfind1. Let me execute the different versions of the command so you can see how it works. PH find one without an argument now prints out a message. PH find one with an argument finds that line in the phone list. PH find one with two patterns prints out the message, too many patterns, only one allowed. Two or more arguments will result in that last message. While this correctly handles variable number of arguments, it still doesn't solve the problem of what happens when the user enters a pattern that's not found in the phone list. For example, I'm not in the phone list. If I search for the name Swartz, you see that I get no output at all. In my experience, Users get confused when programs don't provide adequate output. To provide some feedback, phfind should tell the user that their pattern was not found in the list. The question is how to do that. The shell provides the answer in something called logical operators, which are another kind of conditional statement. Basically, when the shell executes a command, it creates a separate process to do so. When that process terminates, it passes back a piece of information to the shell. This piece of information is called an exit status, and it's represented by a small integer. To allow for logical tests, the shell assumes that zero as an exit status means that the process executed successfully. A non-zero value says that the process executed, but it failed. By determining the value of a process's exit status, the shell can perform logical tests, treating zero as true and non-zero as false. The shell has two operators for doing this. Logical OR is represented by two vertical bars, or two pipe symbols. The logical OR operator is interpreted as follows. The shell executes the command to the left, in this graphic represented by the letter A. If that command fails, that is, returns a non-zero exit status, it will execute the command to the right of the logical OR operator. In this graphic, it's represented by the command B. Let me reiterate. The logical OR executes command A. If it fails, it will execute command B. If command A succeeds, command B will not be executed. That's the condition. Command B is only executed if Command A fails. Commands fail for two reasons. Number one is that commands fail because there was an error during execution. This could be because the input file doesn't exist or because there was some error in specifying the arguments on the command line. The second reason is not that the command failed but that it's using the exit status to identify something about the command itself. An example would be the grep command. The grep command uses its exit status to identify whether or not it found a match in the file. If the grep command finds at least one match in the file, it returns an exit status of zero, success. If it doesn't find any matches, 
in the file, it returns an exit status of non-zero or failure. By combining the grep command with a logical OR operator, we can tell the user when grep doesn't find the pattern in the phone list. Consider this command. If the pattern is not found in the phone list and the grep command fails, the logical OR will execute the echo statement that says the pattern was not found in the phone list. If the grep command finds the pattern, it will succeed and the echo statement is not executed. We can make ph find one sensitive to whether or not the pattern is found in the phone list by replacing the grep command with this logical statement. I've made this change and stored it in the file phfind2 on my system. Here's what it looks like. Now, if I ask phfind2 to locate Swartz, the message I get is that Swartz was not found in the phone list. In addition to the logical OR operator, the shell also supplies a logical AND operator. This is represented by two ampersands. The logical AND operator only executes command B if command A succeeds, which is just the opposite of the logical OR operator. If command A fails, then command B doesn't get executed. The text contains a couple of examples of using both the logical AND and the logical OR operators. This marks the end of this section. Please review the manual and refer to the chapters in the text that cover the case statement and the logical operators. Then work the exercises suggested in the manual. Before we can continue on and do more advanced shell programming, we have to learn about how the shell handles variables. You're probably aware that variables are ways to store data temporarily inside a programming language. The shell's variables are like those in other languages. They have to start with an upper or lowercase character, and they can contain characters or digits in the name. Like most computer languages, you can assign variables values with an assignment character, the equal sign. For example, if I want to store my name in a variable called name, I can use the command name equals Ray. Note that there are no spaces around the equal sign. The only way to assign a variable a value is without spaces around the equal sign. If you put spaces around the equal sign, the shell will think you're trying to enter a command line and it won't work. Once you've stored something in a variable, you can retrieve what's in the variable by putting a dollar sign in front of the variable's name. To extract the name in the variable name, I would do it this way. I would echo out dollar name. Note that the echo statement prints ray because that's what's stored inside the variable name. Variables can be used inside shell scripts to store information that we need to use later in the script. As an example of using variables in a script, let's make the phfind script more general in nature. Currently, phfind reads from phone.list in the current directory. I've hard-coded that file name into the phfind script itself. This is poor design. Instead, I should have a general phone list file on a system directory, and then everybody should reference that file with an absolute path name. 
The name of the system-wide phone list file on my system is slash user slash data slash phone dot list. I don't want to hard code this name in my script either. What I suggest you do is assign a variable with this path name and then use that variable when you want to refer to the file name to search. This way, if you need to change the file that holds the phone list, you need only change this assignment inside your script. The variable will handle the rest. I've made this change in a script called phfind.var. The very first thing we do in this file is assign phone file, a variable, the absolute path name of the phone list I wish to search. Next, we have the case statement that determines how many arguments were on the command line. I'm doing the same commands. The only difference is that instead of using phone.list, I'm using dollar phone file in the one argument section. The shell will put the absolute path name there when it executes the command line. If I need to change phone list files, I simply make the change at the top of the script. Because the phone list is the same in the system directory and my local directory, I won't execute this script because it will work the same as the previous phone find to script. Variables provide a great deal of flexibility. In addition to assigning variables, I can read the value of a variable off the standard input. This means I can have the user enter a pattern if they don't specify one on the command line. To read a value off the standard input, you use the read command. You list on the read command line, the name of the variable where you want information stored that's read off the standard input. The read command says to read information up to a new line. Store all of that information into the variable or variables listed on the command line. For example, the read command can be made to read my name off the keyboard. If I type the command read name, notice the shell is waiting for me to enter something. I type in my full name, that gets put into the variable name, and now when I echo out what's in that variable, you see that it's stored exactly what I entered on the keyboard. I can use this if the user doesn't enter any arguments. Instead of printing out a usage message, I can tell the user to enter the pattern with an echo statement and then read their pattern off the command line and then search for that pattern in the phone file. This requires that we change the program around a little bit, but basically it works this way. Either the user will supply a pattern or I'll prompt for a pattern. In either case, I want to run grep with that pattern to search through the phone list. This means I have to change the case statement a little bit. Because now the purpose of the case statement is to select the pattern that grep will use. In this case statement, if there are no arguments on the command line, I print the prompt for the user to enter the pattern they'd like the system to search for. I then read in the variable pattern. If one argument is entered on the command line, I store that argument in the variable pattern. If more than one argument is listed on the command line, I print out an error message and then exit the script with the explicit exit command. If no arguments were entered, or if one argument was entered, the case statement terminates and I 
then search the file for the contents of the pattern variable. If that's not found, I then echo out the message that that pattern wasn't found. I've stored this script on my system as phfind.read. Let's take a look at it. As you can see, I define the variable phone file to be the system phone list. I use the case command to identify the pattern to search. And then I search for that pattern in the file identified by the phone file variable. Let's see how this works when I run the command without specifying an argument on the command line. As you see, it prompts me for the pattern to search for. I'll enter Swartz to show you that it still prints an error message that Swartz was not found in the list if it can't find the pattern you enter. It's very common to use echo and read commands together. You use the echo command to prompt the user to enter information that is read by the read command. It's customary for prompts to be printed on the same line where the user types. The echo command will not print a new line if you tell it not to print a new line. You do this by putting a backslash C at the end of the message you want to print. This is the echo statement that prints the prompt within phfind.read. The backslash C at the end of the message is what tells Echo to leave the cursor at the end of the line. In this case, that allows the read command to take the input right at the end of the prompt. There are other special characters that you can put inside an Echo statement. They're listed both in the text and in the course notes. Another thing that is necessary when you're working with variables is being able to test the values inside the variables. Unix supplies a special command to do this. This command is called the test command. Recall that the Unix shell treats the exit status as a way to make logical distinctions about commands that it executes. We've already used this to determine whether Gret found something in a file or not. The same thing can be done with the test command. The test command takes a series of arguments. Those arguments are treated as a logical test. If the test is true, then the test command succeeds. If the logical test is false, then the test command fails. This is all controlled by the exit status of the test command. The test command takes three kinds of logical tests. Numeric tests, string tests, and file tests. The list of possible test operators for the test command are listed in the course manual and described and demonstrated in the course text. And I'm not going to go into them here. We'll use the test command later in the course. But let's move on to another aspect of the phfind command. Presently, if the user enters more than one argument, we simply print a message that tells the user that there's too many arguments and there's nothing we can do. It'd be much better if we assume that each argument on the command line was a separate pattern and then search for each pattern in the phone list. What I'm describing in programming would be called a loop. That is, we want to execute the same set of commands repeatedly based on the number of arguments on the command line. If there are three arguments on the command line, we want to search for three separate patterns in the phone list. 
The commands are all the same. The only difference is which pattern we're going to use. The shell provides a special loop command that allows us to do this easily. It's called the for loop. The for loop controls its iteration by a list of arguments which are passed to the for loop itself. The for loop executes a series of commands once for each argument passed to the loop itself. This graphic shows a prototype of a for command. It begins with the word for. It's then followed by a variable whose name you select that is assigned the iteration argument every time you move through the loop. The value of variable changes each time through the loop. You then have the word in, which is followed by the list of arguments you want the for command to loop through. In this case, we're going to loop through the four values, one, two, three, and four. The word do and done mark the beginning and end of the loop commands. In this case, the loop consists of an echo command, which is simply going to print out the values taken by the loop variable as we move through the loop. As I'm sure you can see, if I were to run this for loop, I would see the values 1, 2, 3, 4 printed out on the screen. In this case, I use the variable count as my loop variable, though you can use any legal variable name here. This graphic shows another version of the for loop. Note how the for loop begins. There's no word in, and there's no list of arguments being passed to the for loop. When used without an argument list, the for loop assumes that you want to loop through the command line arguments. This is how we want to use the for loop. In phpind, we're going to use this for loop command. Now I've chosen the word pattern as my loop variable because that's what's on the command line. The patterns I'm going to search for in the phone list. The command that I want to execute within the loop is to search the phone list for the first pattern on the command line. If it doesn't find that in the phone list, it prints out the message, this pattern's not found in the phone list. We then loop again for the second pattern. We search for it. If we don't find it, we print out the message. We continue to do this as long as there are arguments left on the command line. This is all handled automatically by the for loop. I've combined the for loop with the phpind read command to create a script that both prompts the user if they don't enter a pattern and will search for any number of patterns on the command line. This is what that command script looks like. Inside the case command there are only two options. If there are no arguments on the command line, I prompt for a pattern, read the pattern, and then check to see if that pattern's in the phone list, printing a message if it isn't. If there are one or more patterns, I loop through all of them, searching the phone list for that pattern, printing out the error message if it's not found. Because the for loop can loop once or several times, I only need one option to handle all the number of patterns the user might put on the command line. Also, note that the combined logical OR statement that runs the grep command, and if it fails, then runs an echo statement, is too long to put on one line on my machine. So I simply press return after the logical operator. 
This is perfectly fine, and the shell understands what I mean. I indented the echo statement in the script so that I would know this was really a continuation of the line up above. The indentation is not required. Let's demonstrate phfind.read1 by searching for Jones and Smith. This marks the end of this section. Please review the notes, and in particular, read through the chapters in the text on both variables and the for loop, and work the exercises listed in the course manual. We've gone about as far as I want to go with the PH Fine script. Let's take a look at another kind of shell programming task. Let's suppose that you want to be able to update the entries in the phone list without using an editor like VI. Instead, you want to write a script that prompts the user for the first name, prompts the user for the last name, and prompts the user for a phone number and then automatically writes it into the phone list maintaining the appropriate format of the phone list. This is easily done with a series of echo and read statements. Let's take a look at a program that does this. I've put it on my system and called it phadd. The phadd command works like this. First, we prompt for the first name and store that in the variable fname. We then prompt for the last name and we store that in lname. We combine those two together to prompt for this person's phone number. We store that in ph number. We then echo out the last name, comma space, the first name, a tab, and then the phone number. Note the double greater than. This shell meta character says to put this line at the end of the existing phone list. Let's add my name to the phone list. After I enter my name, it asks me for my phone number. As you can see, my name has been added at the bottom of the phone list. I'd like to draw your attention to one aspect of this program. I want to make sure that the exact format of the phone list was maintained when I printed the line entered by the user into the phone list. This requires making sure that a comma and a space and a tab get inserted between the appropriate fields. I did this by enclosing the entire formatted line inside double quotes. The shell treats anything inside double quotes as ordinary characters with the exception of the dollar sign when it's in front of a variable name and the back quotes. In this case, the shell did substitution for F name, L name, and PH number, but left the tab, the space, and the comma as is. Double quotes are commonly used like single quotes. However, double quotes allow the shell to substitute for variables. While PH add works, it doesn't work very well. The problem is that it only allows me to enter one name per execution of the script. If I want to enter another name, I have to re-execute phadd. In fact, I'd have to run phadd once for each name I wanted to enter. This is inconvenient, and I'd prefer that the script continue to prompt me for names until I had no more to enter. This will require that we add a loop to phadd. We can't use the for loop because the for loop only works if I know how many times I want to loop before I start. 
it's much more convenient if ph add quits when I'm done without me telling it how many names I want to enter to begin with. The shell has another kind of loop that we can use in this instance. It's called the while loop. The while loop doesn't loop once for a pattern. It runs a command each time you get to the top of the loop. If that command succeeds, here's the prototype syntax of the while loop. It begins with the word while, which is followed by the command line you want to execute to control the loop. If the command succeeds, you execute the commands listed between the keywords do and done. If the command fails, you skip to the first command underneath the word done, in effect terminating the loop. We want to use the while loop to control the entry of names. To make this work, we're going to add some loop control mechanisms. When the user completes the entry of a name, we're going to ask them, would you like to enter another name? If they say yes, we want to keep looping. If they say no, we want to terminate the loop. I'm going to use the variable answer to hold the loop control value. As long as it is equal to a lowercase y, we're going to continue to loop. When the user enters n, I'm going to assign an n to answer, and that's going to terminate the loop. Here's an example of the code that will prompt for an assign of value to answer. I echo out enter another name, I read in the variable answer, and using a case statement, if what the user has entered starts with a Y, then I assign a Y to answer. If what the user enters starts with an N, I assign an N to answer. There's something to notice about this case statement. Take a look at the patterns listed in front of both case options. Because I don't know whether the user is going to enter yes or a Y for the affirmative response, or N or no for the negative response, I'm using file matching characters to identify something that starts with a lower or uppercase Y and has any number of characters, or something that starts with an upper or lowercase N and has any number of characters. Because the case command is executed by the shell, I can use shell file matching meta characters to create the patterns in front of the different case options. The value assigned to answer can be tested with a test command. And this is the command that is going to control the loop. As long as answer is equal to Y, this test command will succeed and the loop will continue. If the user enters N and N is assigned to answer, this test command is false, the command fails, and the loop terminates. In order for the loop to begin the first time, I have to initialize answer to Y. I've entered all of these commands into a file called phadd1 on my system. When I execute phadd1, it prompts me for first name. I'll enter my assistant's name and his phone number. As you see, the program asks me if I wish to enter another name. In this case, I don't. I'll enter in, and the script terminates. If I'd had more names to enter, I could have done so by entering Y at the enter another name prompt. I need to say something about the format of the test command. Because it's common to control a while loop with a test command, the people that designed Unix decided to provide an alternative format for running the test command. 
to make it look more like the traditional programming languages they were used to. You can use the word test to run the test command, or you can use an opening square bracket. As long as you put a closing square bracket at the end of the test command line. Instead of controlling the loop with this command, I could have written it this way. The command does exactly the same thing, it just looks different. And you need to be aware of the different formats of the test command. phadd1 works and allows the user to enter several names, if that's what's desired. A problem that it has, however, is that it doesn't test the data that's entered in any way and therefore allows users to enter the same name several times. One serious problem with databases is when the data that they contain is no longer accurate or is duplicated, which is what would happen in this case. It'd be best if phadd1 tested the data before it allowed the user to enter it and then put it into the file. To do this, we can use the grep command. Recall that the grep command will succeed if it finds a match and fail otherwise. In order to test if the data is valid, we need to run the grep command in the middle of our while loop and then do two different things based on the exit status of the grep command. If the grep command is successful and a match to this person's name was found, we should tell the user that this name already exists in the phone list. If the grep command fails, a match was not found, and this is new data and the user should be allowed to continue data entry. In this case, the phone number. What we need then is a conditional statement that allows us to run a command and based on the command's exit status, execute two different sets of commands. In programming languages, this would be called an if test. And that's exactly what it's called in the shell. This graphic shows the prototype syntax of a simple if statement. The word if is followed by a command line that you wish to execute. If that command line succeeds, the commands after the keyword then are executed. You also can have an else section of an if test. That section would be executed if the command failed. The entire if statement terminates with the word if spelled backwards, fi. I need to test, when the user enters a name, whether that name is already in the phone list or not. I can do that with this if test. I need to be very careful about rejecting false duplicates. As a result, the grep command here searches for an exact match of the names. That's why I'm searching for the last name, a comma space, the first name, and then a tab. The names must match exactly for this to report a duplicate. If the grep command succeeds, the user is trying to enter a name already in the list. If the grep command doesn't succeed, the user is entering a name that is not in the list, and we should continue on, allowing them to enter the phone number. Because there are two different sets of commands I want to execute, I'm going to use an if-else statement. It would look like this. First, I have my grep test. I then have the keyword then. If the grep command succeeds, I echo out duplicate found in the list. Entry terminated. In the else section, of the test, what will be executed if the grep command fails, is to prompt the user for the phone number and then to write the name and phone number into the file. 
regardless of which of these two pieces are executed, I'm going to ask the user if they want to enter another name. The loop will continue that way. I've integrated this if test into the code for phadd1, and you see the result. The while loop works in three steps. First, we prompt and enter the first name and the last name. Second, we check for a duplicate name in the list. If there is no duplicate in the list, the else section of the if test, we prompt for the phone number and then print the name and phone number into the phone list. The third section asks the user if they want to continue entering names. This three-step loop will continue until the user enters no, they want to stop. I've entered this on my system as phadd1.if. Let's execute it and see how it works. If I try to enter myself into the list, the system tells me that I'm already in the list and it won't let me do it. In this case, I'm going to enter n that I don't want to enter another name and terminate data entry. Though again, I could keep entering names if I wished. The purpose of this section has been to show you how to use a while loop and how to use an if statement. I tried to keep the examples short and clean without going into a lot of details. I've saved this for the textbook, which has a very detailed example of a while loop intermixed with an if test, as well as other commands that are pertinent for large, complicated data entry examples. This marks the end of the video portion of this section, though I urge you to read the section on interactive programming in the text, and then to work the exercises in the course notes. Up to now, we've used 